After Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, Israeli humanist historian Harari has published his second book, Homo Deus The Brief History of Tomorrow. Harari uses his usual macroscopic vision to tell the history, and follows the trajectory of historical development to scrutinize the future. Man has evolved to dominate almost the entire planet. But after overcoming all kinds of ancient problems, are we satisfied with our present life? Are you and I the same, not wanting the best, but only better? Human beings have endless desires and ambitions, what will the future of human beings be like? The author gives us a direction. In Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, Harari talks about the fact that human beings are not physically special, and that we are practically the same as animals. But with the advent of modern technology, we are developing the ability to play God. Homo Deus The Brief History of Tomorrow is about the future of Homo sapiens in the context of current developments. Over the past century, mankind has accomplished the impossible, controlling famine, plague and war. Today, more people die of obesity than of hunger, more people die of old age than of infectious disease, more people commit suicide than are killed in war. We are the only species in the long history of the planet that has changed the entire planet by ourselves, and we no longer look to any higher species to shape our destiny for us. Success breeds ambition, and mankind will next seek immortality, unlimited happiness and the divine power of creation. But the pursuit of these goals will ultimately make most people superfluous. So where do we go from here? First and foremost, we need to make today's choice with our eyes wide open to where that choice will lead us. We cannot stop the course of history, but we can influence its direction. The author asks three big questions of modern mankind. Today's technology is capable of solving famines, curing many diseases, and hopefully even preventing death in the future. The right of humans, and other animals, to be more happy than just surviving. The possibility of biotechnology to improve human abilities in the future and to become a god-man. Harari mentioned that the three major problems of the past, famine, pestilence and war have been slowly overcome by mankind, but we have to start facing the new three major problems. The first one is immortality, the lifespan of human beings is constantly extended, assuming that the lifespan is extended for a lifetime, our current system cannot cope with it we will not do the same job in our life, and we will not retire early. And when only some people have mastered such technology, the class gap among human beings will become even wider. The second issue is happiness. The living conditions of modern people are obviously better than those of the ancients, but our level of happiness is not as high as that of the ancients, as if there is a glass ceiling version of happiness that is hard to break through. Harari makes an interesting point. For countless generations, our biochemical systems have adapted to increase the chances of survival and reproduction, not happiness. Behavior that is conducive to survival and reproduction is rewarded by the biochemical system with feelings of pleasure. What if one day a rare mutation occurs that allows a squirrel to feel supreme happiness for the rest of its life just by eating a single nut? It would live an extremely happy, but also extremely short, life, putting an end to this rare gene. It seems that under normal biochemical systems we cannot achieve eternal happiness, but now with the advent of drugs we are able to control the biochemical mechanisms to achieve happiness, but it is worthwhile to explore whether the pursuit of eternal happiness is good or bad. Personally, I think Buddhism has a very good answer to this question. Instead of pursuing fleeting pleasures, it trains the mind to be peaceful. The third topic is the creation of divine beings which is based on the simple idea that there is no reason why Homo sapiens should be the last species to evolve, and that once technology allows us to recreate the human mind, Homo sapiens will disappear, and a whole new process will begin. The author focuses on bioengineering, brain-machine integration, and artificial intelligence. In terms of bioengineering, human beings may be able to modify their DNA to achieve spiritual evolution, while brain-machine integration and artificial intelligence may enable life to enter into an inorganic form, and once inorganic, we will be able to abandon our organic shells and explore the infinite galaxies of the universe. This sounds like a scary topic, 
but later chapters will explore in detail why this trend is happening. This is also the central point of the book, will inorganic life continue for the next generation? Part I, Homo Sapiens Conquers the World Chapter 1, Three New Issues for Humanity For thousands of years, mankind has faced the same three major problems, famine, pestilence, and war. In the past few decades, however, these problems have not yet been completely solved, but they have been transformed from incomprehensible, uncontrollable forces of nature into manageable challenges. There are three new issues facing mankind. First, when death is gradually approaching its end, and the dream of immortality may be realized, how should people face it? Second, how will society change when happiness becomes a natural human right and individualism takes precedence over nationalism? Third, when biomedical engineering, cyborg engineering and inorganic life engineering continue to progress, and mankind will leap from the status of Homo sapiens to Homo sapiens, which is tantamount to holding the power of God, what will be the ultimate fate of mankind? Biotechnology and information technology have brought powerful new forces to mankind, making it doubly urgent for mankind to focus its attention and creativity on what to do. Judging from past records and current values, the next goals may well be immortality, happiness and becoming a god. Religions and ideologies are very open to death, and some even welcome it. For modern people, death is a technical problem that we can and should solve. We can already feel the storm coming, immortality is at hand, and human beings are no longer equal. The rapid development of certain fields makes the prophecies more and more optimistic. Our ideology values human life and will work to overcome the causes of human death. In the war on death, if there are significant scientific advances, the real battleground will shift to the parliaments, the courts, and the streets, and if the scientific effort is declared to be victorious, it will lead to intense political conflict. So immortality is not necessarily a good thing. Over the past few decades, more and more people have come to believe that it is not only necessary to have the right to pursue happiness but also the right to be happy. Happiness is not easy to come by, and there is a mysterious glass ceiling to happiness. Happiness or pain is simply the sum total of the body's sensations, a reaction to the way you feel inside. But the bad news is that pleasure fades quickly. Because of our evolutionary needs, human beings have to want things all the time so it's not easy for them to find long-term fulfillment. In addition to immortality, humans also want to pursue eternal happiness. The biochemical pursuit of happiness is the world's number one cause of crime. However, new drugs are being introduced every year, and the demands of countries and the market are constantly changing, making it more and more difficult to control. There is also research into the use of electrical stimulation and genetic engineering to control the human body. Regardless of the exact methodology, it is not easy, but modern scientific research and economic activity is geared towards the goal of perpetuating pleasure. In the pursuit of happiness and immortality, mankind is in fact trying to elevate itself to the status of a god. Until now, the increase of man's power has depended mainly on the improvement of external tools. In the future, the focus may be on improving the human mind and body, or directly combining humans with tools, through biomedical engineering, cyborg engineering and the continuing progress of inorganic life engineering. In the 21st century, the third major issue for mankind is the evolution of Homo sapiens into a God-man. A God-man is not an omnipotent God, but merely possesses supernatural powers. Human beings will gradually change their characteristics until they are no longer Homo sapiens, and they will leap from the status of Homo sapiens to Homo Deus, which is equivalent to holding the power of God, so what will be the ultimate destiny of human beings? The world as we have constructed it may collapse within a few decades. But we can't afford to put the brakes on it. It was all about healing in the first place, but that is by no means the end of it. Whenever there is a major breakthrough in mankind, it can't just be used for healing, not for evolutionary upgrading. Precisely because we are faced with different options, we should have a clear understanding of the current situation and take the initiative to make decisions, 
rather than passively waiting for decisions to be made. The prediction that the goal of humanity in the 21st century will be immortality, happiness and divinity needs to be clarified, first, most people will not be directly involved at all, second, it is a historical prediction, not a goal, third, pursuing it does not mean that we will get it, and fourth, it is meant to be a discussion of the available choices. It is a contradiction in historical knowledge to study history in order to break free from the clutches of the past, e.g., by adopting Marxist judgments, one changes one's own behavior, thus preventing communism from taking hold. Historians do not necessarily give good guidance to the present when they examine the behavior of their predecessors because the circumstances are very different. Moreover, science wants to broaden the horizons of mankind, and historians do not want to repeat the past when they study it, but rather, they want to liberate themselves from it. For the past 300 years, the world has been dominated by humanism, the cult of the human being. However, the rise of humanism has also sown the seeds of extinction, and is a flawed ideal. The future described here is only the future of the past, a future that is pointed to based on the ideas and hopes of the past 300 years, but the real situation is definitely much more complex. In order to understand this, one needs to go back and understand what kind of creature Homo sapiens is, why humanism has become the dominant religion of the world, and how the dream of humanism may instead lead to its collapse. The reason people are afraid of change is that they are afraid of the unknown, but the most constant fact of history is that everything changes. Chapter 2, The Anthropocene Compared to other animals, human beings have long been incarnated as gods, but not particularly just and merciful ones. We are now in the Holocene, and the last 70,000 years have been the Anthropocene. Human beings have become the single most important factor in global ecological change. In the Anthropocene, Homo sapiens broke through the barriers between the ecological zones of the Earth and the Earth became a single ecosystem. Before the agricultural revolution, all other human species were exterminated, 90% of the large animals in Australia and 75% of the large mammals in the Americas. Large animals were the first to suffer because they were relatively few in number and slow to reproduce. When humans started farming and animal husbandry, it led to a new wave of extinction. Livestock have now become the dominant species, with more than 90% of large animals domesticated into livestock. Agriculture has changed the whole pressure of choice, but not the physical, emotional and social drives of animals. The agricultural revolution gave humans the ability to secure livestock, but ignored their subjective needs. The agricultural revolution has produced new types of suffering that are getting worse. Mammalian animality is a trait shared by all mammals. Emotion is the key to survival and reproduction for all mammals. Mammals long for the mother-infant bond. Organisms are also algorithms, and an algorithm is a systematic set of steps that can be used to perform calculations, solve problems, and make decisions. Feelings, emotions, and desires are the algorithms that govern human decisions, important decisions about mates, careers, and places to live. The algorithms that control humans operate through feelings, emotions, and thoughts. Agricultural transactions between man and God, theistic religions that began as agricultural enterprises, deified Homo sapiens, and turned other natural phenomena into silent decorations. The agricultural trade was good for both man and God at the expense of the rest of the entire ecosystem. Animal interests, such as sacrifices and the story of Noah's Ark, were also for the benefit of mankind. The agricultural revolution also became a religious revolution, and some kind of cosmic power gave man the right to control other animals, which became man's assets. Agricultural societies also began to recognize different classes of people as assets and established slavery. In the scientific revolution, even the lines of the gods were deleted. Following the laws of nature, we relied on curiosity to learn more about the universe, to become more powerful, to gain enough knowledge to create a technological paradise, and to allow human beings to evolve and ascend to the status of gods. The scientific revolution gave birth to the religion of humanism. 
the worship of man and the influence of Homo sapiens are the basis for judging good and bad. In recent years, there has been an unprecedented interest in the fate of so-called inferior beings, perhaps because we are about to be reduced to inferior beings? Is it because we are on the verge of becoming inferior beings? Is it because computer programs have gained unprecedented power beyond human intelligence? Should computer programs be considered more important than human beings? Chapter 3, The Uniqueness of Human Beings The moral justification for this is found in the fact that there is no scientific evidence at all to support the idea of human uniqueness. But there is absolutely no scientific evidence whatsoever that human beings have souls. The concept of a soul is simply contrary to the basic principles of evolution. The basic principle of evolution is that the highest achiever survives. Darwin is making us lose our souls, which is contrary to our most cherished beliefs. Evolution is change. It cannot produce an eternal entity. A complete whole, indivisible or alterable, cannot come into being by divine choice. The human eye, for example, is a complex system of evolution. The soul cannot be divided into parts, so how can an eternal soul emerge from a child? The mind is very different from the soul. Mind is the flow of subjective experiences in the brain. It is a stream of consciousness, which is the concrete reality that is directly observed at all times, and it is different from the concept of eternity of the soul. Subjective experience is characterized by sensation and desire. A computer does not have feelings and desires, so it does not have consciousness. Even human beings have sensory and emotional circuits in their brains and process data in a totally unconscious state. The new theory is that feelings and emotions are just biochemical data processing, unconscious algorithms, not subjective experiences. Do many people think that animals have no consciousness, or only equivalent consciousness? Scientific research on mind and consciousness shows that consciousness is generated by electrochemical reactions in the brain, and that this mental experience performs some important data processing functions but how subjective experiences are created remains unanswered. From fMRI, electrical currents in the brain correlate with a variety of subjective experiences and images and feelings can be induced by stimuli. The interaction of electrical signals in the brain creates a more complex stream of consciousness, similar to the phenomena of traffic jams and stock market crises. However, the question of how consciousness is generated remains unanswered. Why do we need consciousness? Why do humans have subjective experiences? Subjective experience is essential to human survival and explains human behavior. Scientists have provided detailed descriptions of how neurons are stimulated one by one to emit signals. If the whole system is a transmission of signals, why feel? Dominoes don't require any subjective experience, so why do neurons need to feel? The mind is capable of storing memories, making plans, and automatically generating thoughts, but memories, imaginations, and thoughts are still signals triggered and assembled by neurons. Why subjective experience is necessary is unknown. The life equation. What happens in the mind does not happen in the brain. It happens in the global workspace where many neurons interact. There is no algorithm that can point to subjective experience and all data processing created does not require subjective experience. What is the need for subjective experience in order to reflect on the self? The situation is different, e.g., a self-driving car has no feelings, emotions, or desires, and that is not half the problem. In the history of science, theories, and concepts such as ether, God, soul, etc. have long been discarded. There are very detailed biochemical explanations of sensation, and there is no longer any room for subjective experience in the mind. However, the experience of suffering is a direct and concrete fact that cannot be denied. Another approach, which leaves behind the concepts of mind and consciousness, is to deny relatedness rather than existence. Some scientists believe that all relevant questions can be answered by studying the brain. However, Modern politics and morality are based on subjective experience, such as the morality of abuse and rape. Consciousness is recognized as real, and may have high political and moral value, 
but it has no biological utility. Consciousness is a byproduct of certain brain programs that have no biological use, such as noise, but just exist. Consciousness is a byproduct of the brain, and surprisingly, that may be the best answer. It may be misleading to think of living things as machines that perform calculations and make decisions. In the 19th century, the brain and mind were compared to a steam engine because it was the most advanced technology, and much of the psychological terminology was derived from mechanical engineering, such as military pressure relief terminology. In the 21st century, the human psyche was compared to an information processing computer. Computers are now thought to be mindless, but how can we be sure that they are not? In humans, it is now possible to distinguish between conscious mental experience and unconscious brain activity, and to identify some of the electrochemical features of consciousness. This has been used in stroke patients and even in communicating with patients. Currently, science has concluded that everything we experience is the result of electrical brain activity, and that it is theoretically possible to simulate virtual worlds that are indistinguishable from the real world, and that the possibilities are endless. The problem of other minds is insurmountable. The best test for recognizing the presence or absence of consciousness, when used on a computer, is called the Turing test, which tests for conformity to social norms, but cannot be used as proof. Recognizing the existence of other minds can only be said to be a social and legal convention. It doesn't matter whether a computer is conscious or not, it only matters what human beings think. Human beings have to determine whether an entity is conscious or not, to find out whether it can establish an emotional relationship with them. Dogs are not mindless automatons to their owners. In the case of humans, we have been able to characterize the brainwaves of consciousness. Preliminary tests on the brains of monkeys and mice have indeed shown the brainwave signature of consciousness. In view of the discrepancy, who should bear the burden of proof in the absence of conclusive tests? The Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness states that the evidence suggests that the neural substrates used in the production of consciousness are not unique to human beings. The New Zealand Parliament has passed an amendment to the Animal Welfare Act. Psychiatric drugs are designed to induce changes, including behavioral and sensory changes. Pharmaceutical companies use rats in their experiments because they believe that rats behave in the same way as human beings, a common premise among psychiatry laboratories. It is believed that most animals do not have self-consciousness. For example, a dog's reaction to food, smell, and objects cannot be said to be without self-consciousness. There are more complex versions, with varying degrees of self-awareness. Only human beings know that they have a past, a future, and a continuing self, which can be expressed in words. The squirrel's storage of nuts is only a momentary impulse. Humans can feelings and understanding of narrative situations, such as dreams, can be expressed without words. Parrots, for example, have memories, and may have a sense of what is going on. In addition, chimpanzees such as Santino at the Swedish Zoo can throw stones, prepare, hide, and wait for an opportunity to act, whether Santino is conscious, the choice of rats, and the intelligent Hans's understanding of body language are all questions of the other mind. In essence, humans are not that different from some mammals. Most studies cite intelligence and tool-making as key factors in the rise of man, but they were not enough to conquer the world. Humans dominate the planet in their ability to unite and cooperate flexibly on a large scale. Effective cooperation was the key to the success of the Russian Revolution. The Romanian Communist Party, which ruled for 40 years, collapsed overnight, and its achievements were stolen by the National Salvation Front organization. The Egyptian Revolution is another example of the necessary conditions for rule. Human achievements have been made possible by large-scale flexible cooperation, but they have also undermined humanity's more sacred beliefs. The ultimatum tournament experiment showed that Homo sapiens acted not according to mathematical logic, but according to social logic, with an emphasis on fairness. This led to the belief that primates are inherently moral and that fairness is a universal and eternal value. These theories apply to primates or small groups of people, but most human kingdoms and empires are extremely unequal, 
and stability and efficiency are good. The behavior of large groups of people is different from that of small groups of people who believe in the law of inevitability or in the divine commands of the gods. All large-scale human cooperation is based on an imagined order that conforms to immutable laws. Reality is divided into three categories, subjective, objective, and reciprocal. Interdependent reality exists through the communication and interaction of many people. For example, money, laws, gods, and nations, but it is not easy to admit that one's own god, one's own nation, one's own values, and the concepts that give meaning to our lives are fictions. But the truth is that the meaning of most people's lives exists only in the stories they tell each other. Meaning is created the moment we weave a web of stories together. Human beings continue to reinforce each other's beliefs in a self-perpetuating cycle. The web of meaning is tightened so that we can only believe what we believe. To read history is to watch these webs being woven and torn apart, and to see that meaning is not present in the passing of time. The Crusades against the Muslims, slavery, castles turned into shopping malls. A hundred years later, beliefs about democracy and human rights may also be difficult to understand. Homo sapiens ruled the world because they were able to imagine the unreal, to use language to create unprecedented realities, to exist in the common imagination. The ability to create interdependent entities also separates the humanities from the biological sciences. Historians want to understand how interdependent entities like gods and nations developed, but biologists have a hard time recognizing this. Biologists believe that all thoughts, emotions, and feelings are biochemical algorithms, and that all phenomena in human society are not outside the realm of biology. Humanities emphasizes the need for interdependent entities to think historically, which means giving real power to imagined stories. It emphasizes stories that people invent and believe to be true, as in the case of North and South Korea. In the 21st century, the boundaries between history and biology may now become blurred. We will rewrite the DNA chain in response to ideological fictions, redesign the climate for political and economic gain, and replace the geography of mountains and rivers with cyberspace. With the translation of human fictional imaginations into genetic and telecommunication codes, mutual subjective reality will engulf objective reality, and with the fusion of biology and history, fictional imaginations may become the most powerful force in the world. Therefore, we must decipher the fictional imagination that gives meaning to the world. Part 2 Homo Sapiens Gives Meaning to the World Chapter 4 The Storyteller Homo Sapiens Lives in a Triple Reality As history unfolds, the influence of fiction grows, subjective and objective realities, rivers, fears, desires, etc., are often sacrificed, and new technologies may make fiction even more powerful. Human beings think they make history, but history actually revolves around various fictional stories. Sumerian deities are the equivalent of modern corporations. The cognitive revolution has allowed Homo sapiens to talk about things that are only imagined. The Sumi deities function as the modern equivalent of brands and companies. The gods are legal entities, and the day-to-day -day business is left to the temple priests. The Egyptian pharaohs, who were living gods, were truly powerful entities that built dams and pyramids, and the crocodile Sobuk, who was the equivalent of a pharaoh, could also be gods. A modern-day Elvis Presley is more valuable as a brand than as a living body. About 5,000 years ago, writing and money allowed people to push the limits of the human brain's ability to process information, leading to the creation of bureaucracies. Words allow people to organize their society in an algorithmic way. The modern hospital is an algorithmic system. Words also allow people to become accustomed to experiencing reality through the mediation of abstract symbols, making it easier for them to believe in the existence of fictional entities. Anything written on a piece of paper is at least as real as a tree, for example. For example, the passport issued by the Consul of Vineyard in World War II was part of the largest rescue effort ever mounted by a single person. The Great Leap Forward and the Collective Farm Movement in China, which resulted in famine, were described and recreated in writing by officials at all levels. The official written reports clash with the objective reality, 
and it is the reality that gives way. The bureaucracy keeps getting more and more power, and sometimes it doesn't even change the story to fit the reality, but changes the reality to fit the story. The external reality finally agrees with the bureaucrats, and the reality has to accommodate the bureaucracy. For example, in the partition of Africa in 1884, the borders were reflected by the European bureaucrats who had never set foot in Africa. The fantasy of the pen meets the reality of Africa, and the reality is forced to surrender. The modern education system is also full of examples of reality bowing to words. The industrial era saw the emergence of a mass education system in which students were assessed by scores. First factories and governments got used to thinking in numerical terms, and then schools followed suit. Once the bureaucracy adopted this standard, the reality changed, and most schools wanted points and high grades. The power of the written word reached its peak with the advent of the Bible. At first, the text recorded reality, but when the bureaucrats gained power, the text gained power, and the scriptures were written that claimed to describe the complete reality. Abraham Lincoln's statement that you can't fool everyone all the time is wishful thinking. The power of the human cooperative network relies on a delicate balance between truth and fiction, and on myths to effectively attract believers. If scientists were to travel back in time to ancient Egypt, they would be at a loss, as is the case in Afghanistan and Syria today. Truly powerful human organizations are those that are able to base their fictional beliefs on a compliant reality, such as the concept of money, or the use of grades in the education system to measure students. Religious organizations claim that the Bible has all the answers. The wise man becomes the classical authority and remains in power for a long time. Monotheistic religions are self-centered. The human child experience is characterized by self-centeredness. Herodotus, Thucydides, Sima Qian, etc. developed a very sophisticated view of history, similar to the modern view of history. Even evangelical republicans blame others, such as China. But when the two world views clash, the Bible knocks the enemy to the ground, as in the case of the Greeks' acceptance of the Jewish view of history. The Bible provides a better basis for massive human cooperation. It is ironic that the oath of office of the President of the United States of America, as testified to in the courts of Britain and the United States, is based on a book full of fictions, myths, and fallacies. There is nothing wrong with fictional stories per se, and they are necessary. However, stories are a tool, not a goal, a standard. Human beings invented these concepts in the service of humanity, but they often serve, sacrifice, and die for fictional concepts. In the 21st century, it is possible to create more powerful fictions, more centralized religions. It will be more difficult to distinguish between fiction and reality, between religion and science, but it will become even more important to do so. Chapter 5, An Enemy Pair, Religion and Science in blind faith in fictional stories, human endeavors are often used to glorify some fictional entity rather than to make life better for those who actually feel it. Has the rise of modern science changed the basic rules of the game? Are modern social institutions becoming increasingly biased in favor of objective scientific theories, such as evolution? Is science a modern myth? Scientific theories are definitely not just some way of getting people to cooperate. God helps those who help themselves, as in the case of antibiotics, has nothing to do with God. The modern world is very different and has largely overcome famine, war, and plague. Is it possible that in the future mankind will stop caring about fictional gods, nations, and corporations, and focus on interpreting the realities of physics and biology? Myths still dominate mankind, but science only makes myths more powerful, and allows the interlocking realities to take full control of both objective and subjective realities. With the help of computers and bioengineering, mankind has been able to reshape reality to fit the fantasies in their minds, and the line between fiction and reality has become increasingly blurred. What is the relationship between religion and science in modern times? Religion is not the same as superstition. Religion is not the same as superstition, because what one believes must be the truth, and only what others believe is superstition. 
Similarly, very few people think they believe in supernatural forces, but rather that they are part of nature. Religion is the belief in supernatural power, the belief that one can understand all natural phenomena without relying on religion. It is also wrong to say that religion is belief in God, because communism does not believe in God. Communism does not believe in God. Religion, however, was created by man, not by God. Religion should be defined in terms of its social function, and any all-encompassing story that confers a higher degree of legitimacy on human laws, norms, and values than those of ordinary people should be considered a religion. Religions will say that mankind is subject to a certain moral system, created by heaven or derived from natural law, revealed by various prophets, such as the Muslims not eating pork, the Nazis killing Jews, and the human rights issues of the Middle East. Liberalism and communism are also religions, because they believe in a system of moral laws that were not invented by man, but that man needs to follow. All human societies have such beliefs, and their members must obey some moral code that is higher than that of the general population. Different religions have different stories, different commandments, rewards and punishments. The historical laws of communism are the commandments of certain religions, which cannot be changed by man. For some people, religion represents a pathway to spirituality. Religion is a contract, and spirituality is a journey. The journey usually begins with some big question, who am I? What is the meaning of life? What is good? For most scholars, academic research is also a contract that leads to a predetermined goal. There is a spirituality to the process, a remnant of ancient dualism. Dualism warns of breaking the chains of materialism, the spiritual journey is an escape from the secular order, and religion is a consolidation of the secular order. The spiritual journey challenged Zen to kill the Buddha, it was Martin Luther, a Protestant, who pushed for a revolt against Catholic authority, refusing to accept the various answers offered by the Church in the form of rites, rituals, and covenants. From a historical point of view, the spiritual journey is always a tragedy because it is a solitary path, suitable only for the individual. Human beings need firm answers if they are to cooperate. The overthrow of old religious systems often leads to the establishment of new laws, rituals, and institutions. Buddha and Jesus were not immune to the subversion of traditional Hinduism and Judaism. Two Perspectives on the Relationship Between Science and Religion 1. Science and religion are not mutually exclusive. First, science and religion are not mutually exclusive, but in fact they are not necessarily opposed. Science needs the help of religion and values in order to create viable human institutions. Science studies how the world works, but it cannot tell us what to do. Science tells us that we cannot survive without oxygen, but only religion can answer the question of whether or not asphyxiation can be used to kill criminals. The construction of the Three Gorges Dam involves ethical issues, not purely scientific ones. 2. Science studies facts religion discusses values, but religion never discusses values alone. If religion is to play any practical leading role, it must make some factual claims. Many of the most heated religious debates, or conflicts between science and religion, stem from assertions of facts rather than ethical judgments. In the case of abortion, for example, the dispute between liberals and Christians is over facts rather than ethics. Religious propaganda tends to emphasize values, like the Catholic Church, which promotes itself as a religion of love and compassion, but at the same time demands obedience to the Pope, who never makes a mistake. Practical instructions come from a combination of ethical judgment and factual statements. In historical reality, the religious story has three parts. 1. Ethical judgment. 2. The statement of fact. 3. Practice directions. For example, the theory of the imperial patrimony of Constantine was forged 400 years after his death, but it was never mentioned in the religion, while its social and political impact was enormous. Another example comes from the religious story that homosexuality is forbidden by God, which raises the question of who wrote the Bible and when. 
Devout Jews and Christians claim that God commanded Moses to write the Bible without adding or subtracting a word. Scientific research agrees that the Bible is a collection of many texts. It was written by many different human authors, centuries after the events claimed. Scientists have pointed out a flaw, Biblical Judaism was not a scripture-based religion at all, most of the religious priests were illiterate, it was the old Judaism characterized by temple, priests, and warriors. The second temple period was characterized by rabbis and careful scholars who wrote and interpreted scripture, and the new Judaism's strength is in interpretation. Science is not a panacea. Religions like to translate statements of fact into ethical judgments. From the Bible is God-breathed to you should believe the Bible is God-breathed. At the same time, ethical judgments are often hidden in factual statements, such as the sanctity of human life includes every human being has an eternal soul. Similarly, American nationalists claim that the American national sanctity is based on the factual statement that the last few centuries have led to progress. Because human values are always hidden in statements of fact, some philosophers claim that science can solve all ethical dilemmas. The ultimate value of all human beings is to minimize pain and maximize happiness, and there is no ethical dispute among religions, but rather a difference of opinion on how to achieve the goal. But there is no scientific definition or measurement of happiness. Although science has more than its usual role to play in ethical disputes, it still has its limits. Religion can provide an ethical justification for scientific research, and therefore can influence the topics of scientific research and the way in which scientific discoveries and research results are utilized. Bumping into each other on the wrong side of the tracks. The background of the scientific revolution was the most dogmatic, narrow-minded, and religiously fervent of societies. In 1600 AD, the Islamic world was a liberal paradise compared to Europe. The history of modernity is generally viewed as a struggle between science and religion, with each promoting different truths that were bound to clash. But in fact, science and religion do not care so much about truth, and it is easy for them to compromise, coexist, and cooperate. Religion cares most about order and aims to create and maintain social structure. Science cares most about power, the power that can be gained through research, there is a difference between the individual and the whole, on the whole, science and religion do not like truth as much as power and order. A more accurate view of modern history is the process by which science has come to terms with a particular religion, humanism. Modern society believes in humanism, and the use of science is not to question dogma, but to fulfill it. It is unlikely that purely scientific theory will replace humanist dogma in the 21st century, but it is possible that the contract of agreement between the two will break down and be replaced by a very different contract between science and other post-humanist dogmas. Chapter 6 The Contract with Modernity The modern is a contract of exchange, that is, mankind agrees to give up meaning in exchange for power. Pre-modern humans agreed to give up power, believing that their lives were exchanged for meaning and psychological protection. The modern culture no longer believes in the existence of a great cosmic plan, the entire universe is a blind and purposeless process. The modern world does not believe in ends, only in causes. The motto of modernity should be bad things will happen. Human beings are not confined to any predetermined role, and nothing but our own ignorance can confine us to the creation of heaven on earth. This modern contract offers mankind a great temptation but also a great threat. The modern culture is the most powerful in history, but it feels even more existential angst. This chapter discusses the modern quest for power, and the next chapter examines how mankind has utilized this growing power in an attempt to bring meaning back to this infinite universe of emptiness. In the past, economic stagnation was the norm. The quest for modern power has been fueled by a combination of scientific and economic growth, Historically, progress has been slow. In the past, economic stagnation was the norm. A large part of the reason for this was the difficulty of financing new programs, due to the lack of the concept of credit for funding, and stagnation became a vicious cycle of economic inactivity and scientific stagnation. Credit is the economic expression of credit. 
For thousands of years, it has been difficult for humans to believe in the concept of growth because it simply defies intuition, evolutionary experience and the way the world works. The Miracle Cake Due to evolutionary pressures, people have become accustomed to seeing the world as a static pie. Traditional religions want to redistribute existing resources or promise a pie in the sky. The moderns are convinced that economic growth is not only possible, but absolutely necessary. The only solution to problems is growth, and public or private problems are solved by more stuff. Growth is a priority. Economic growth has become the common focus of all modern religions, ideologies and movements, and it has succeeded in achieving near-religious status. This belief claims to solve many, if not most, ethical problems. It is an appeal to individuals, corporations and governments to disregard anything that stands in the way of economic growth, such as social equality, ecology and family ties. Capitalism promises not pie in the sky, but miracles that will fall on the world and sometimes actually be realized, such as overcoming famine, plague credit, reducing human violence, increasing tolerance and cooperation, and promoting global peace. Capitalism's commandment the wheels of capitalism will not come to a standstill until profits are invested in things that will help increase growth. To ensure growth, resources must be found that never run out. This includes exploration, the conquest of new lands, and modern science, which provides new raw materials, energy and knowledge. Science has allowed mankind to discover its own ignorance and has given it a good reason to pursue new knowledge. The problem of resource scarcity appears to be surmountable. The real enemy of modern economy is ecological collapse. It is difficult to slow down to prevent it, and no one can say whether science can save the economy from freezing and the planet from boiling. But as the pace accelerates, the room for error shrinks. If ecological doom is near, history has never had justice, and the suffering of the poor is high. The greater the power of science, the more dangerous it may be, because the rich are complacent. Greenhouse gas emissions, unwilling to sacrifice, want to leave the solution to future rulers. They are not betting on their own personal futures, but on scientists and technologists to build the Noah's Ark of science and technology. The poor don't protest because if the economy stagnates, the poor will be the first to suffer. The race for growth alone is a big problem. For the individual, the tension and pressure is extremely high. Human beings become the responsible bosses themselves, and they feel the pressure day and night. The modern world is one of perpetual instability and change, encouraging governments, corporations and organizations that have become the standard of success. The modern age has led humanity as a whole to believe that balance is worse than chaos, and that greed is good. In the quest for more, the discipline of curbing greed is broken. A large part of the anxiety caused by chaos is relieved by capitalism, given to the invisible hand of the market, which approves the system of greed and chaos. Capitalism dominates the world, and we should understand its strengths and weaknesses. The strengths are its great success in population and growth, overcoming famine, pestilence and war. The contractual commitment with modernity, which requires the abandonment of meaning, may bring about a world of darkness devoid of ethics, aesthetics and empathy. The fact is, however, that mankind is now more powerful, peaceful and cooperative, and that humanistic thought is flourishing. The new religion that has emerged to save humanity is humanism. Chapter 7 The Humanist Revolution The covenant with the modern age has given mankind the power to stop believing that the world has a grand cosmic plan to make sense of life. But there is meaning to be found outside the great cosmic plan, and it is not a breach of the contract. The exception clause is the salvation of modern society, which otherwise would not be able to maintain order. The fact that human beings believe that life is meaningful is a credit to humanism's worship of humanity. Humanism's new faith conquered the world, and human experience gave new meaning to the universe. The main commandment, create meaning in a meaningless world. The major religious revolutions of modern times have given faith to man that humanism can give meaning to the universe. Medieval European culture, with God as the source of meaning and authority. 
humanism recognizes that man himself is the source of meaning and that free will is the highest authority. Rousseau's novel Emile asks people to listen to their own voices. The modern man's confession to a psychotherapist is not the same as confession to a priest, except for the fact that there is no Bible. It is only from the human senses that one has the right to judge the true meaning of human behavior. The institution of marriage has changed in its destiny. In the Middle Ages, extramarital affairs challenged both divine and patriarchal authority, and were unforgivable sins, very different from the present situation. The humanist view of ethics favors human feelings in dealing with emotions. It is bad to make people feel bad. Murder, theft, and portrait making are judged on the basis of whether they make people feel bad. The homosexual debate calls for respecting other people's feelings and opposes turning them into hurt feelings. The Charlie Weekly incident was condemned for hurting the feelings of Muslims around the world. Humanist political views provide meaning to social and political processes. Most countries use democratic elections, where voters are trusted to make the best choices. Voters explore their innermost feelings, but it is not easy to filter through the propaganda, lies, smoke and mirrors, and misinformation. The humanist view of aesthetics recognizes that the only source of artistic creation and aesthetic value is the subjective feeling of the human being. If the viewer finds it beautiful, it is beautiful. From the humanist economic point of view, the free will of the customer is the highest authority. In a free market, the customer is always right. Leif Andersson of Sweden is engaged in the genetic improvement of farm animals, causing pain to animals, but satisfying customers' needs and desires. When multinational corporations want to determine whether or not they live up to the motto don't be evil, it is in the financial statements that the human feeling is the source of meaning and authority. The rise of humanism has also revolutionized the education system. Modern humanistic education teaches students to think for themselves, and importantly, to see for themselves. The inner world, with its depth and breadth, is difficult to measure. The concepts of angels and devils have been transformed into internal forces in the human mind, and heaven and hell are considered to be the inner spiritual states of mankind. This is what Nietzsche meant when he said that God is dead. The origin of authority lies in one's own feelings. Even if someone says he believes in God, what he believes in is his own inner voice. There are three formulas for calculating knowledge. In the Middle Ages. 1. Knowledge equals scripture x logic, and after the scientific revolution. 2. Knowledge equals empirical data x mathematics, which is incapable of dealing with questions of value and meaning. Humanism advocates that. 3. Knowledge equals experience x sensibility. Experience is a subjective phenomenon that includes sensation, emotion, and thought. Sensitivity includes 1. Noticing one's own perceptions, emotions, and thoughts. 2. Allowing these perceptions, emotions, and thoughts to affect oneself. Experience and sensitivity form an infinite loop that reinforces each other. Trying to feel what it feels like to be human. Take tea tasting as an example. Without sensibility, we cannot experience certain experiences, without long-term experience, we cannot cultivate sensibility. We should use the knowledge of ethics and aesthetics, such as the experience that those who harm others will always harm others, and those who honor others will always honor others, and the moral sensibility will become more and more sensitive, providing valuable moral knowledge. Life is an inherent process of gradual change, and through experience one can move from ignorance to enlightenment, as Wilhelm von Humboldt once said, the widest range of experience that can be experienced in life is extracted into wisdom. The modern world created by the pact between science and humanism is sustained by the two opposing, yet interdependent, forces of yin and yang. The yang gives power and the yin provides meaning and ethical judgment. The yin and yang of modernity are sensibility and reason, museum and laboratory, supermarket and production line. Humanism's view of life as a series of experiences laid the groundwork for many modern industries to pursue novel experiences. Modern novels, films and poems emphasize sensation, feeling, rather than actions. Ulysses describes a day in the life of two Dubliners. 
This shift in focus became the basis of popular culture. For example, participants in I Want to Live talk about their feelings, and the Wizard of Ounce embarks on the yellow brick road, opening up to experience and finding meaning. The knowledge equals experience x sensibility formula has not only changed pop culture, but also the way we think about important issues, such as war. For most of history, war stories have focused on the actions of gods, emperors, generals, and heroes. But more recently, the focus has shifted to the little soldiers and their experiences. Like no war on the Western Front or forward to Khmer, war is different from what you see in movies. War is a hell of a way of feeling whatever it is that it creates. Humanism, like any thriving religion, is inevitably divided, with different interpretations of the human experience. The three main sects are 1. Liberal Humanism, an orthodox sect that emphasizes freedom, or liberalism. 2. Social Humanism, and 3. Evolutionary Humanism. Democratic voting is only applicable to people who share a common relationship, such as common religious beliefs, national myths, and basic consensus, but there are still some disagreements to be resolved. Therefore, in many cases, liberalism and many ancient collective identities and tribal sentiments are blended with each other to form modern nationalism. At least in the 19th century, nationalism and liberalism were closely related. Nationalism which protects the unique experience of one's own country and hopes for the formation of a peaceful international community, is still the official ideology of the European Union, whose charter refers to Europe as united in diversity. The EU charter refers to Europe's united in diversity, which creates new problems. Which is more or less valuable, the collective experience or the individual experience? Sometimes democratic voting does not solve the problem. In the 19th century, nationalism demanded respect for the unique experience of each country. In the 20th century, extreme nationalism was intolerant of different people. Social humanism blames liberalism for paying too much attention to one's own feelings, regardless of the experience of others. Socialism, on the other hand, is concerned with how one's behavior affects the experience of others. It advocates that in order to achieve world peace, it is necessary to integrate the workers of the world. In order to achieve social harmony, it is necessary to put aside one's own wishes and prioritize the needs and experiences of others. It is necessary to understand the current socio-economic system and to take into account the experiences of all other people in order to truly understand one's own feelings, and it is only through joint action that the whole system can be changed. Socialism advocates the creation of strong collective systems to interpret the world for us. Politics recognizes that parties and guilds make the best choices. Evolutionary Humanism on the Scene Evolutionary humanism has its roots in Darwinian evolution. It is a belief that conflict is a blessing, not a curse, and that it promotes divine choice and progress, allowing the superior to win. As long as the logic of evolution is followed, mankind will eventually become superhuman, otherwise there is a danger of degeneration and extinction. The superior is the one who has the superior ability, the superior country, and leads the progress of mankind. The war experience of mankind is not only valuable, but also necessary. The protagonist of the movie. The third man looks back on the Second World War and thinks, it wasn't so bad after all. Nietzsche said that war is the school of life and what does not kill me makes me stronger. Hitler was also changed and inspired by the experience of war. Every soldier fights a relentless internal war. Revealing the truth about the world, embracing the law of the jungle. Nazism is an extreme version of humanism, and does not lead us to a wholesale rejection of views that may be even more important in the 21st century. The value of experience three definitions, three perspectives. For example, music teachers, drivers, hunters and wolves feel differently about classical music, rock music, adult music, and wolf howls. For liberals, everyone's experience has the same value. Socialist believers believe that true value is the impact on others and society as a whole, and leave everything to the party and its clerks. 
Evolutionary humanism believes that cultural relativism and social equality hinder social progress and only lead to human degradation and extinction. As humanism conquered the world, the internal rift widened, leading to the worst humanist religious wars in history. Before the First World War, liberal humanism felt that history was on its side. In the following decades, it was attacked from both sides. It was attacked from both sides. On the left, Social humanism believed that liberalism perpetuated inequality, impoverished the masses, and isolated the elite. On the right, evolutionary humanism argued that both liberalism and socialism impeded the choice of heaven, and would only be swamped by the masses of mediocre people, leading to the eventual destruction of mankind. <laughs>